We've now come to the segment on using counseling theories in groups. As you've seen to this point, group leadership skills are an essential component for any successful leader. In support, growth, counseling, and therapy groups, an additional leadership component is the use of counseling theories. A leader needs to have a unified approach that establishes the rationale for when and how to use techniques, or groups can become a mess, a scattered hodgepodge of techniques. Counseling theories provide you with this unified approach and helps you to identify not only what needs to be addressed, but how to do it. There are dozens of sources that discuss counseling theories, so we'll not be covering the basic tenets here. Rather, our purpose will be to show you how to incorporate and use theories within our active approach to group leadership, where individual members are often the focus of attention. The first theory that we'll be demonstrating is Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, founded by Albert Ellis. It's 30 minutes into the first session of a group on guilt. The leader uses REBT to teach and talk about guilt. So you all have done some really good work in, in group and you know we've been talking about this issue of guilt you know and, your, and the work that you're doing around guilt and I, I wanted to sort of go over something here this evening that I thought might be helpful and so in, in getting started with this I want you to think about where does your guilt come from for example if I were if I was going to give you a test and that one test question was where does my guilt come from well how would you answer that test question my past your past? Okay, I'm going to list these up here. <coughs> so your past, okay? Like things I've either done or haven't done. Okay. Yeah. What about others of you? Jen's saying her past. What about others? And my religion and my mom. Oh, okay. So mom. Some others of you have talked about guilt my, related to mom, too. And my religion. And yeah. religion, okay. Yeah. Mine's kind of not being a good mom. Not being a good mom. Yeah. Okay. Not being a good mom. Um, Anybody else? Yeah, Eric. That accident I had where that uh, kid ended up in a wheelchair. Oh, okay. So the the car wreck. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna have. I haven't heard from you. How about you? Where would you say your guilt comes from? Being an unsupportive friend. I have a lot of guilt about that. Being an unsupportive friend? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, so you all have all of these things that go on in your life, events or situations with your mom or being a mom or... Um, Jane, how about for you? Um. <coughs> like marrying American and my parents just afraid that I'll lose my heritage and not going back to Taiwan anymore. Okay, so marrying the wrong person yeah. according to your parents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so an events you see how these are events or situations or things that go on in our life marrying the wrong person you know the car wreck a lot of people and, and me as well you know we're raised to believe that these events or these situations cause our feelings right we're sort of raised to believe that that those cause our guilt but I want to teach you something and I learned this in my early 20s, and I'll tell you, it changed my life. Uh, and and here's, the, here's the idea. These events and these situations don't actually cause how we feel. Is that a new concept to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. So, if they, so if they're not causing how we feel, what causes it, right? Here's what causes it. It's our self-talk. It's what we tell ourselves about these situations or these events. So I'm going to write that right here, our self-talk. Now I know that's a, new, that's a new thing for most of you, right? <coughs> yeah, it's not the event, and this is the best news that you ever learn, because if you learn how your self-talk controls how you feel, then you can control how you feel. And a lot of you are, are, have struggled in here with large amounts of guilt. 
So if we understand what we tell ourselves about these events, then we can change it because we can be in control of what we tell ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We can control our thoughts. So let's, let's take, for example, um, maybe Eric, let, let's go with yours. What do you tell yourself a, on a daily basis about that wreck? Uh, let's just focus on that for a second, and we'll go around and, and we'll we'll look at this for each of you. But Eric, what do you tell yourself about the wreck? I should have known better. Okay. Um, that um, my life is over. I mean, as I know, is over. It's, everything is messed up. Everything is messed up. Okay. I'll never be able to get over this. I will never say that again. I I'm will never be able to get over this. I mean, get over this. How can I? Yeah. Okay. You see how that's what Eric tells himself. You do that every day, right? You get out of bed and you start running that sort of message in your head. Okay. If we can change what Eric is telling himself, then we can change the guilt that he's feeling. And let me let me say this to you. I'm not saying that we can get Eric to feel good about the car wreck right? Mm -hmm. But do you think it's possible that Eric is telling <clears throat> himself some stuff that's not quite accurate that might be leading to his increased feeling of guilt? Like, let, let's look at this one. I'm going to pick on this one first. I'll never get over this. I will never get over this. If, if Eric, if you keep telling yourself that, I think you're going to stay stuck feeling guilty, right? But let me ask, let me ask, and I want you to watch when I ask this. Let, how many of you in the group think that Eric could get over this and move beyond it? How many of you think that? Look at that, Eric. They they think it's possible. Go ahead. What are you going to What are you thinking? I mean, I shouldn't get over this. I mean, I changed somebody's life. I don't think I should get over it. How many of you think that Eric could give him that we that we should work to give Eric permission to get over this? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody makes mistakes. He made a terrible mistake, right? It was a car, what do we call them? Accident. An accident. An accident. I know you feel very guilty. We are, our job and the purpose of this group is to help you feel what? Less guilty. Less guilty, okay? I will never get over this. Let, let's do this again. What, what, that's not, we just decided that's not a true sentence. How can we make Eric turn that into a true sentence? Great job of teaching REBT, Chris. Teaching is truly therapy in this case because it gives members something they can use in the future to deal with their guilt. Chris also went on to focus on some of the members' specific self-talk. Next, we'll see Ed use Adlerian concepts. Let's watch. Let me talk about something that's different, I mean a little different. Uh, there was a, this famous psychologist, Alfred Adler, and he came up with the idea that your birth order really makes a difference. You know, are you the youngest, you the oldest, you're the middle? So I'm gonna, and, and he said that has as much impact on you as, uh, you know, your parents. So I'm going to just ask you to tell me, what's your birth order? I'm the oldest, I'm an only child, I'm the youngest, whatever. Morgan? I'm the middle child, oldest girl. Okay. Middle child, oldest girl. How many of you are middle children? Just, just me, you. I guess. Okay. <laughs> Megan? I'm the oldest. Okay. Oldest of how many? A uh, younger sister and a younger brother. Okay. I'm the youngest. The youngest? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go around and then get that, and then we'll ask how it affects you. I'm the youngest. Okay. I'm the oldest. Youngest, oldest? Youngest. Okay. Here's the next question. How did this affect you? Just think, because being the oldest, how does being the oldest, how, that's different than being the youngest. What effect did being the youngest, you know, is it having on your life? Y'all are all juniors or seniors in high school. My, my brother wasn't around very much because he's 12 years older than me, so... So that would put you almost an only child. Yeah. Yeah, that would put you there. And what effect did that have? Well, since he wasn't around, I mean, I was basically the baby of the family. I got to do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. What about you being a middle child? What effect did that have? 
Um, well, I literally felt like I was always in the middle, kind of always mediating and kind of the go-between person because we're all five years apart. Okay, and you said you were young? Mine was more like irresponsibility and being a little more carefree because my older siblings had the responsibility part. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. me. <laughs> what? Um, uh, you had no. Miss responsibility? Yeah, I mean, my mom and dad worked a lot. Um, they still do, and I, like when they were little, I had to take care of them all the time, and mm -hmm. still do. Mm -hmm. And they, and basically, they get away with anything too, and I never did. Go ahead. Yeah. Y'all both smile. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, my brother, he's seven years younger than me, so I was always the one taking care of him, and it's like he had two mothers, so he could get away with absolutely anything, and I had to be the responsible adult. Always. Let me get you in, Joe, then, and I'm gonna ask another question here. Go ahead. Well, I, I was your brother, basically. <laughs> I was, you know, I... Gee, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I expected, you know, people to kind of take care of me, yeah. and um, being the youngest, like, I, I got away with anything. Yeah. I really did. Yep. Mm -hmm. I still do. Yep. <laughs> Here's a good question. How do you how do you currently find your place in your family? Are you the smart one? You're the clown. You're the sports one. You're the dumb one. You're the, mess up, you're the responsible one. How do you find your place? I'm kind of the clown, but you know now I'm approaching graduation coming up, and I kind of want to be taken more as the responsible one because I never have been, and so I see myself as the clown. Yeah. But this is a good, important question. How do you find your place? I think for me, being the youngest and everybody else is already out of the house, I, I find that um, when we all get back together, it has to do with me. And so I don't know like how that relates to me finding my place, but I find that like I, I bring people to get the family together. But it is important. We each find our place somehow. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think we talked. I'm the responsible one. I wish I could be the clown. Some days I wish that that's where I could be, but I don't know if I'm not. <laughs> okay. When I say what impact, I mean, I, I don't know if this is really getting wheels turning in your head, but I think all of you ought to think, wow, my birth order matters. I mean, it, it, in my mind, because the oldest is often very responsible, the youngest is often irresponsible. Or in the middle child often feels in the middle. So th these are things I want y'all to think about. I mean, seriously think about. And the same thing is that question about how you find your place. Everybody wants to belong. That's a fact. And they figure out a way to find their place, either being the quiet one, the clown, like you said, you're sort of the clown. Is this interesting for you? I mean, what, are wheels turning or not? Hmm? Go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, so what? You know, like, so what does it mean, though? Like, it, what do I do with okay. it? Okay, the first thing you do with it is you think it, it's awareness of who am I, and so that you sort of, that's really what I'm trying to do in here, is get you to be more aware of who you are and where and why you are the way you are. That's, that's what we're trying to do. As you can see, theory provides not only structure for the group, but gives group members concepts that can transfer for life outside the group. And this is the real purpose of groups, to help members in their everyday life outside the group. 